Welcome to Conversations with Corrections, hosted by the Utah Department of Corrections. This occasional podcast features staff, incarcerated individuals, and other stakeholders of the UDC discussing issues that impact corrections, both nationally and within the state of Utah. Here is today's host, Department Spokesman, Lean Truchard. And hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Corrections. I'm Lean Truchard, and today we are joined by Jarrett Anderson. Jarrett is a chaplain in the Volunteer and Religious Services. That's part of the Division of Programming. Jarrett, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. So, Jarrett, as most people are going to want to know, what does a chaplain do in prison? Yeah, I like telling volunteers that I never intended to end up in prison, uh, but it's ended up being such a beneficial um, experience. So I playfully say that a chaplain is a professional, decent human being. And another fun joke is I am a state employee handling religion because of the separation of church and state. Like that that's kind of a, f- a funny paradox. Uh, because what happens is as soon as the state takes full responsibility of someone, we are then responsible for their constitutional right to worship. And so to put it as clearly as possible, my responsibility as a chaplain in volunteer and religious services, a programming chaplain, is I work at the um, Utah Department of Corrections to facilitate the inmates' right to worship. Okay. How, how did you end up in prison? <laughs> um, I wanted to interview for this position kind of, kind of on a lark. I freaked out my lieutenant because when he offered me the job, I said, let me, let me think about that. Um, so I taught religion for 13 years. Um, first, I did biblical studies And then I taught world religions at Westminster College for seven years, and it was a wonderful opportunity. And in 2013, I designed this course on the future of religion. I'm really interested, as we'll come back around to, I'm sure, in why we humans do what we do, you know, and and how we can be better. I'm very interested in, you know, the social sciences of, of human behavior and then organizational. And prison <laughs> is a very powerful intersection of those elements. And so I had this intuition that I didn't listen to in 2013. I had this intuition to serve the imprisoned and dying. Um, I intuited after teaching religion for years and years and seeing the power of it, you know, And my favorite thing about studying, working in religion is that I get to deal with the big questions and the big issues every day. Uh, Like my Tuesday is the worst day of someone's life. And so I had a pivot in my own life. And after a second divorce, I started working as a chaplain And interestingly, I've been working toward joining the military for seven years, and that's finally going to happen probably next month. Um, But I worked as a hospice chaplain first. Um, I've had the privilege to know over a dozen World War II veterans. You know, that was amazing. Um, Had a 103-year-old patient that I've been taking care of in hospice. So I've been working for six years as a hospice chaplain, almost six years as a prison chaplain, and three years as a hospital chaplain. And so I'm most interested in serving kind of at the extremes of human experience. And prison, I think a lot of us can resonate with this, working at the prison has been such a more rewarding experience than I imagined. Uh, One way that I structure thinking about life is like the idea of the thing versus the reality of the thing, right? And all of us have these ideas about prison, of course, you know, from media or anecdotes. And my favorite thing about working in prison is, again, the intensity of the structure. And I'm not embarrassed to admit that in my first six months working here, I was called into my captain's office several times because going from academia, you know, which is a very like 
open, outside the lines structure. Um, it was definitely a learning curve uh, working here in corrections, but I am definitely a better person because of it. So really the short answer is I saw the job you know, opening, I applied for it, and I'm really glad I did. So help me understand what it is that a, a chaplain, especially like a programming chaplain, does on a day-to-day basis inside a correctional facility like Utah State Correctional Facility or the Central Utah Correctional Facility? I'll answer that in two parts because I I do think it's important to understand what a chaplain is and what a chaplain does and then how that work applies to a prison correctional um, environment. So a chaplain is a minister outside of a church setting. It's, It's that simple. And so we are providing both religious needs and um, basically trauma emergency response needs. And the basic, the history of chaplaincy that I won't get into, don't worry about it, is basically uh, the military, hospitals, they needed Catholic priests, to be honest. You know, they needed someone to provide those religious rituals at the end of life. And so chaplains provide those religious, you know, what we would call existential needs, which is, again, those big questions. Um, and we, we provide those needs. So, uh, again, a programming chaplain here in corrections. So, again, usually what we're doing is we're providing spiritual services and also helping people basically deal with life, you know, deal with life and death. And so a chaplain shows up where life breaks open. Uh, You know, so in my hospice work, I help patients and families cope with the end-of-life decline and death process. At the hospital, which a bit of a dark joke I call speed hospice, because I only have like half an hour, hour, a few hours to help patients and families deal with the fact that they're dying. Um, So interestingly... In the prison environment, as you can imagine, it's much more it's much more structured than that. So the primary thing that I do as a programming chaplain is I listen to the inmates about what they need in order to worship, and then I coordinate with community resources, usually volunteers, to meet those needs. Um, and so what I do a lot is, again, answer inmate requests, and then I facilitate those bigger opportunities, something like religious services. Now, are you required to filter some of those requests? Because uh, a lot of the times um, volunteers want to do something, uh, but that may not be permitted in our structure. And so are you like uh, also telling people, no, we can't do that for you? Absolutely. Uh, One of my very favorite parts of my job is doing the volunteer trainings Um, We can talk about this, but I'm really excited to be working in our office to help the process be more structured. And so, for example, we used to have, um, we have four programming chaplains, three here and uh, one in Gunnison. And we used to do our chaplain work assigned by um, area, you know, so there'd be a chaplain for these, these areas and a chaplain for these areas. Um, but it meant that we were having the same conversations in lots of different places. Um, and so the way that we're structuring it now is I do all the volunteer trainings and I respond to all of the inmates and then we coordinate and the other chaplains, you know, fulfill those. Um, so it's kind of like a head chaplain type organization. But absolutely, like one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from my time in prison is that a good idea outside of policy and procedure is a bad idea. And that's one of my favorite things to remind uh, volunteers about, you know, orienting them to the prison environment. And what I encourage volunteers to say is, I don't know, let me find out. And to work with the chaplains so that the inmates can get their needs met in a way that is, of course, within the security needs of corrections. Um, Because 
what we're doing in programming, of course, is we are providing inmates opportunities within a secure environment, within current policy and procedure. And so just the other week, I was doing a um, religious service for the inmates, and I drew a Venn diagram. And I said, okay, one of these circles is your requests. You know, you can, in your heart, you can worship <laughs> however you want. I mean, at at the fundamental core, that is what is actually protected, you know, by the Constitution, is our personal right to worship. And I said, then the other circle is the policies and procedures of Utah Department of Corrections. And so, and then the other circle is the constraints by a particular religious tradition itself. Um, and so, for example, how sacrament or communion is handled in prison is handled differently with different religious um, organizations. And so that's how I try to communicate it. And I say to the inmates and the volunteers, I want to find a way to get to yes, again, within these constraints. How can we meet the inmate ne inmate needs in a way that is within UDC policy and procedure and also respects limitations that may be on the religious side of things? Um, one of the challenges I think that you would have or that any chaplain would have is that there's, you said, f basically four of you, but there's dozens of faiths that are currently housed in our facilities. And how, how do you branch out uh, and deal with people of multiple faiths, possibly faiths that are not uh, ones that you're maybe f so familiar with? Um, now, I, I realize that in Utah, there's a predominant religion here. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, surprisingly, uh, there are uh, a number of them. And we do provide services. Uh, uh, there's... Uh, for those who practice Native American traditions, we have sweat lodges. Um, but how do you, as a chaplain, deal with beliefs and faiths that you may be unfamiliar with, or at least not as familiar with? Yeah, I mean, I, I have an un I'll get to the spirit of the question. Like, I have an unfair advantage because I taught world religions for seven years, and my divinity degree, that is a real thing. I have a literal master of divinity. Uh, sounds like I'm making it up, um, but it's not any more made up than anything else that we do in civilization. Um, so a master of divinity is roughly equivalent to a master of social work. You know, it's a professional master's degree. And my master of divinity is an interreligious and intercultural chaplaincy. Um, but from a procedural procedural perspective, what we do is I look at all of the religions that we support here in corrections and then I find what we, the short answer is we use community resources. Um, I don't need to be the expert in these different religions because I can connect. The Salt Lake Interfaith Roundtable is a fantastic uh, resource. And so what I do is I will communicate with the inmates about what they need, and then I will work with them to find community resources. So for example, um, one challenge that we are having is it is difficult to find someone to officiate pagan services. Um, every religion has its strengths, and paganism is very free-spirited. You know, it, it's very independent-minded. It's not... Um, there isn't like a hierarchical structure. In fact, that is very against the spirit of paganism. Um, there are individual groups. Um, Islam is interesting, for example, because Islam is a very rigorous, structured religion, but it's not hierarchical. You know, there isn't some central body of imams, you know, that you can go to for official um, you know, Judaism is similar, where there's some organizational structure. Uh, but the, the short answer is we communicate with uh, community resources to get the services that we can. Uh, but I, it's important to remind inmates that what is actually protected is their individual right to worship. And so that's my top priority 
is to help inmates receive the resources that they need um, in order to worship according to their sincerely held religious belief, which is the legal language of what is protected by the Constitution. And everything else is a bonus. You know, there are different religions have different emphases. And so what we do, again, within the constraints of policy and procedure and the way that religion is structured is we provide inmates with their own resources to so that they can worship and cultivate their spirituality and religious practice. Let me let me see how I can ask you this question. I have I, I often take people through our facility, uh, both of them. And I have been in the room when somebody has said, I don't think the spirit lives here. <laughs> So let me ask you, it, you mentioned extreme scenarios. Prison can be an extreme scenario. So how do you find, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, goodness and faith and um, uh, all of those things in that environment? I love the question, and it's a bit of a plot twist answer because— those who have been through difficult situations know from experience that we often connect most deeply to these deep questions when we are at the extremes. And so with, with respect, um, everything is always about us, right? So when someone says, I don't think the spirit lives here, um, that's about them you know, and, and their experience. And if I were to extrapolate, um, I would imagine, um, deduce, that what they're really saying is, I am uncomfortable here. I am in an unfamiliar environment. And with my under... I, what I'm doing is just like breaking down the, the subtext, you know, what's underneath that kind of comment. Like, I am uncomfortable here. I can't imagine how I would feel the spirit, you know, here, or I don't know how if I were a prisoner here. But this is where we get back to that idea of the thing versus the reality of the thing, because, and this happens to be one of my very favorite topics, you know, which is how do we as humans experience life? Um, and one of the surprising things, so the military is another passion of mine, of course, and this gets into, I won't get too nerdy, um, but this gets into the field of what's called positive psychology, which is the psychology of thriving. And it's how do we, how are we at our best? And one of the paradoxes and surprising insights about human nature that once we name it, it seems clear, is extreme circumstances bring out our best or our worst. And this is where we, and, and sometimes both in complicated ways. And one thing that I've learned about human nature is that we are as good, healthy, productive, whatever the target is, as we are incentivized and empowered to be. And at its best, at its most aspirational, this is the philosophy of corrections, right? Um, the philosophy and the purpose of corrections is that we take people under extreme circumstances, you know, they have done, they have made choices um, that are deemed serious enough that they need to be put in their own area where there can be a focused, structured, rehabilitative program, right? And the reality is that when, when we are in these extreme circumstances, things become so much more clear. And, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs where it's like you have to, you know, have food and stay warm or you'll die and then you need relationships and things like that. But one thing that I love about being a chaplain is that these spiritual or existential needs cut through the entire pyramid. Um, and so I there's a version of the Bible that's called Free on the Inside. And I have found in my communication with um, incarcerated individuals that the extremity of the prison environment actually functions as an invitation 
to connect with those questions of deeper meaning. And so I think that the spirit, you know, um, however we're using that, can actually work best in the extremes. Because the way that we humans work is we very quickly take things for granted. Hedonic treadmill is the fancy pants term for that. Um, and so we, you know, we, we get used to things. And so it's actually in these extreme environments where we are the most connected to these big questions and um, these kind of transcendent experiences. And I'm not trying to roman um, romanticize prison at all. Um, I mean, it's really a privilege. Like I work with dying people all the time. Like I, I have the privilege to spend literally the last moments of people's lives. Um, I have been in proximity to hundreds of deaths. Um, and prison, I call prison life skills with catastrophic consequences, you know, where what is needed and what is encouraged in a prison environment is it's the kind of stuff that all of us need to figure out. You know, how do we reach our goals? What are our values? How do we handle the annoying person next to us? It's just that, again, in prison, it's a much more intense environment. That's interesting. Very interesting. Um, so you're in this extreme environment, okay, which can go in any direction at any moment. What are some of the challenges you face um, emotionally, uh, spiritually, physically, while being a, a prison chaplain? The biggest challenges that I face are not my challenges. Um, because as a prison chaplain, I have a very structured and protected um, role, right? Uh, like I get to go in and out to the housing you know, units and drop off a Bible. Like that's, that's easy. Um, I get to respond to inmate requests. I feel much more for um, to be very direct, um, the, our staff. Um, I have a tremendous amount of concern and caring um, for our staff because one of the benefits of my role is I get to work closely with all the different, you know, populations. Like I get, I work directly with the inmates, I work directly with the volunteers, and I work directly with the staff. And it's interesting because the inmates are the most constrained, but that means they also have the most structure. Uh, you know, like they are in the programming flow. And, and that is my primary job, is, is I help the inmates succeed um, with their, you know, in their programming by, funny enough, like spirituality is not part of the case action plan <laughs> at the moment, um, but I provide for programming needs um, that help them along. Volunteers are easy too, you know, because volunteers get to come to prison more or less on their own terms. You know, of, of course, you know, the purpose of volunteer training is so that they can, you know, do their volunteering within policy and procedure. Um, but again, as, as a programming chaplain, and like staff are not my primary responsibility, um, but I feel very, very motivated to help structure programming and especially help inmates um, get their needs met, their existential uh, needs met, which are questions of what's important to them, you know, what are, what are their values. And one of, one of my favorite things about programming is that the better job programming does, the better security can do. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to overstate this, but um, occupied inmates are easier, <laughs> you know, to manage from a security standpoint. Um, and one thing that I'm passionate and excited about when it comes to, um, again, meeting these needs of incarcerated individuals is spirituality has the potential to help them feel human again. Um, and just to kind of comment, I, an, one of the ways that um, corrections is extreme 
is it can be very dehumanizing, of course, you know? Um, and I'm really grateful to be able to have a role in um, helping, like volunteers are very important with this, but helping the inmates connect to their humanity um, and staff connecting with their humanity um, is its own challenge, but that's something that um, I'm also, you know, motivated to help with as much as I can. But like in in the direct re primary responsibility of my job, um, I want to help inmates again connect to their values, their better selves, which of course is what corrections is for, you know, ideally. Um, so again, kind of everything else runs more smoothly. As an emotional toll on a person in your position with, do, do you do what you can not to internalize all of the, all of the obstacles you see others face? How do you, how do you go home at night and not bring all of that with you? Again, the pivot answer is that I actually do. Um, I, I internalize everything, but then I let it flow through me. Like that's um, to, to make a very big statement for a moment. Um, one of the purposes of life that I've learned by doing end of life care for six years is the purpose, one purpose of life is to facilitate the flow of feelings and experiences through our body and then make the most of it. It's very simple and very hard. And one privilege that I have as a chaplain is I get to engage with, with whole people, you know, whole people in the environments. Uh, chaplaincy, um, religion is the most comprehensive cultural system in existence. Um, people who are religious will tell you that there is no part of their lives that religion does not touch. Like that, that, that's kind of how, that's how religion is structured. And granted, we, we each have a different relationship to religion, but that's how religion functions, is it is utterly comprehensive. And so um, normally, in order to do our job well, we have to focus. So for example, at the hospital, nurses and doctors, like you do not want your doctor being distracted by you as a whole person. <laughs> like. You want the doctor laser focused on whatever part of your body, <laughs> you know, that they're working on. Um, nurses and doctors do their best work when they're focusing. And I think corrections is a very challenging environment because we are engaging, again, with humanity in an extreme environment. But the way, so here are a couple um, tools that I use to be emotionally, to stay emotionally healthy. Um, and one is the reminder that it's all true whether or not I'm looking. Like it's it's already happening. Um, this is a grief processing and emotional processing um, tool that I call "Don't Let It Go." Pick it all up. Um, you know, so if I were a correctional officer, for example, I would say, um, "Yes, I am a correctional officer, but that's not all I am." Um, and I also do rituals, like I use rituals in order to process things. So for example, right when I get home, I change into comfortable clothes, you know, as a reminder that I am, I am now home. Um, I journal compulsively. Um, and so I also do breath work a lot. And so I, like, again, I have the privilege that well-being in extreme situations is my training. Um, and so one amazing thing about, like, a uh, powerful thing about chaplains is we literally train our nervous systems. So playfully, I say that the role of a chaplain, and this is more like a trauma chaplain, is to do nothing calmly in crisis. And that's a technical term for what's called the, or that's a play, like a way of talking about what's called a non-anxious presence. So I have trained myself to be non-anxious under almost any circumstance. And so what, again, I have privileges that most people don't. Like I have the privilege of managing my feelings being literally my job. You know, it is my job. It is my training. 
Um, and so the short answer is that I have developed my own routine so that I am constantly processing through uh, my experiences and my, and my process, you know, and, and what I deal with day to day. Um, I have some friend, you know, close friends and relationships where I can kind of like process through a hard day, of course, within the confidentiality um, constraints. But really the short answer is I'm really honest with myself. Um, I don't resist or avoid much. And so all of this is helping me kind of like metabolize and talk through. And prison isn't even my intense job. Um, hospital is much more intense. Like I'll process, like I'll help with four or five deaths in a single weekend or something. The intense thing about prison is the structure of it and the constraints within it. And um, I would say um, to finish out this question, um, the hardest thing about my job is the hardest thing that's about every job, which is how do we fulfill our responsibilities with the limited resources that we have. I deal a lot with people who say, I, I don't care about prison. Uh, I, if it was up to me, you should throw them all in there and, and throw away the key. What is the one thing you want people who are not inside a correctional institution and have no care or concern about anybody in a correctional institution. What's the one thing you want them to know as a person of faith? I would say then get rid of prison. Um, I playfully call this like emotional jujitsu. Um, a really important part of correction or of chaplaincy is meeting people where they are. And I don't resist much, you know, and so if someone said, I don't care about prison, I don't care about prisoners, um, what I do is I don't try to correct them. I just help them see the full implications of what they're saying. Because, and I actually um, gave a talk at a, an interfaith prayer meeting um, where I said, if we invested in children the way that we invest in prisoners, there would be almost no prisoners. And so, you know, we call prison the inside, you know, on the inside versus on the outside. And um, if someone says, well, once someone is on the inside, I don't care about them. And that's not what, the, what they really mean. Um, I think um, the root of most bad behavior is overwhelm, you know, and so, I think what's underneath that kind of conversation is I'm overwhelmed by the idea of prison and I'm angry that we spend so much money on prison. And these are, these are valid concerns. Um, so what I would say as a chaplain to someone who says, I don't care about prison and I don't care about prisoners is I would pivot it and I would say, then let's work together on helping people not get there. Jared Anderson? Chaplain in the Programming and Volunteer Services at the Utah Department of Corrections. Thank you for being with us today. And for everybody else, thank you for listening. This has been Conversations with Corrections from the Utah Department of Corrections. These podcasts are on our website at corrections.utah.gov or on the UDC YouTube page. Suggestions for a future topic can be sent to corrections at utah.gov. Thank you for joining us.